Our gospel on this Sunday morning comes to us from St. Matthew. This is chapter 22. Glory to you, O Lord. The parable of the wedding banquet. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. One went to his field, another to his business. The rest seized the servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you can find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told his attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, o Christ. Grace and peace to you from God the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to visit a little bit about weddings today. I officiated at a wedding once, just one. It was windy, it was outside. The microphone worked half of the time, so I'm yelling for part of it, and I'm trying to talk a little softer on another. Um, I worked really hard on the message, and I'm not sure anyone heard it. It was kind of a shame. Um, I'm not a big wedding guy. I don't know many men. Actually, I'm not sure if I know any men who really like to go to weddings. I was in a wedding once as a groom. I won't be in another wedding as a groom ever again. That was a one and done. Wish my wife was here to hear, to hear that, and that would be good. Uh, I am, however, intrigued by the simple weddings of the early 20th century. I've read a bit about them. I've looked at some old newspapers, and those newspaper announcements went something like this. Marvin and Mabel were married on Thursday afternoon in the home of Marvin's parents. Family and close friends attended. The couple will honeymoon in Niagara Falls at a later date. For now, there are chores to do and crops to harvest. It's kind of like this. We got a wedding coming up. It's going to be Thursday. Clean up the house. Get a wedding license. Get a marriage license. Invite the preacher. Let's get hitched. Not all weddings happened that way, but in the 30s, and 40s, it seems the matrimony of it all was more important than the celebration. My wife Leanne and I are blessed with a pretty frugal daughter, and this frugal daughter of mine married a Dutchman. Now, I don't want to stereotype people of a certain heritage, but if the Irish have tempers, and Norwegians are stubborn, and Germans got all kinds of problems, I guess I can say the Dutch demand a deal if they're of the mind to actually purchase something. While, while my daughter wasn't married in our living room, I actually suggested she use our backyard. I was denied. Her wedding certainly was not over the top. Tessa's mother and I were more concerned about the man and the marriage than we were about some open bar bash. 
Evidently, wedding celebrations were important in the days of Jesus. His first miracle of turning water into wine happened at the wedding at Cana. A wedding celebration in Jesus' day could last as many as five to seven days. That sounds expensive. Food and wine would be expected and it would be available, as would clothing. Clothing? I didn't know that until I started studying for this message. In a land filled with peasants, some well-to-do fathers of the groom would provide wedding-appropriate clothing for the guests. It's kind of odd. Jesus brings up the example of a wedding to teach the powers that be, the chief priests and the Pharisees, about the kingdom of heaven. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding feast for his son. Uh, we don't have to dig too deep to understand that the king is God and that the son is Jesus Christ. But in this parable, the king would expect a crowd, and he wanted to make sure there was a crowd. So when you need to get something done in the years between B.C. and A.D., you send your servants. The king tells him, tells them, his servants, go tell those who were invited that the wedding is on, it's happening. But they don't come. They may have RSVP'd, we'd prefer beef over chicken, please. But they are a bunch of no-shows. Who turns down a celebration hosted by the king? Well, actually, many do. So the king sends even more servants out. Go, he says. Tell those I've invited that the dinner is ready. The beef is on the barbecue. But those servants are ignored too. And not only were they ignored, but their invited hopefuls, they leave. They go leave to find their work in the field. They go to tend their business. Well, how rude is that? But it, even, it gets even more rude. The, the ones, those who were invited, that didn't take off for the field or for their business, the ones who didn't leave the scene, they grabbed the servants, mistreated them, and killed them. I think the term mistreated in the NIV is a little soft. What does that mean? They were mistreated. Were these servants, were these servants of the king, were they humiliated and tortured before their death? I think, I think that's probably so. What a bunch of ungrateful, violent, and deadly subjects of the king. Why did those servants have to pay such a high price? They were just doing what they were told. What about that old saying, don't kill the messenger? But they did. They killed several of the king's messenger servants. The king is enraged, and he sends his army to destroy the murderers that were once on his guest list. That's pretty dramatic, going from guest to villain. So he sends even more servants. Servanthood, evidently, was a very risky job back then, and it rarely ended well. The king is disgusted, and he tells his remaining staff, those I invited, they didn't deserve to come, and they don't, in, they don't deserve to enjoy what I've prepared. Go now into the streets and find anyone who will come. Find the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the servants, this time, had some pretty good success. They were able to fill the banquet hall for the king. But that brings us to this very confusing climax to this parable. And if you read it ahead of time, I hope you were just as confused as I was. The king got what he wanted. His banquet hall was full. People from all walks of life finally appear at the wedding venue. But then the king encounters a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. It seems like a pretty mild offense, especially when you consider who was invited. But the king addresses the issue with the man and asks him, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? And the man in the street clothes 
is speechless. He has nothing to say. It's never good when you can't defend yourself, at least with an excuse or two, even a pathetic excuse. And it is not good for this guy. The king, who seemed to have a never-ending supply of servants, he goes to his attendants and tells them to tie up this guy. Tie him up, this man who dared to enter this banquet wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt. And he tells his attendants, throw him outside of the banquet hall into the dark of the night. Well, that's not all, because the dark of the night is the location, Jesus tells us, of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The king is saying, send this man into hell. Wow. Is this all just because he's underdressed? No. The groom's father, the king, was extremely generous as he extended his invitation to these unsuspecting people that were on the street. He invited them to his son's wedding banquet. He was generous to the point of being willing to provide a suit and a tie. This parable isn't about dress code. This isn't about what is and is not appropriate to wear to a wedding and a wedding feast. This is about being clothed by the king. Everyone's invited. Some decline. Some just don't show up. Some kill the messenger. But everyone was invited. We know that the king is God, the groom is Jesus. God wants us to be clothed in the love, grace, and mercy of his son, Jesus Christ. When we refuse that gift, when we refuse to be clothed in the Savior, and when we are asked on the day of judgment, where are your wedding garments? What are you wearing today? We best not be found speechless. We better have something to say. There's only one answer we'll have to give on that day. And that answer won't have anything to do with your goodness. It won't have anything to do with your effectiveness, your productivity, your bank account, your portfolio, or your winning personality. The only answer God is expecting is, I am clothed in the blood of your righteous lamb, my Savior Jesus Christ. He has washed me in his forgiving blood and my clothing, and I came out of the wash white as snow. Not only am I not guilty, I am innocent of all charges. Isaiah describes what we have waiting for us in the kingdom of heaven. It's really rather nice. A feast of the best food and wine is prepared for us. At this banquet, there will be a celebration beyond compare. The shadow of death that David speaks about in Psalm 23 is swallowed up forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from the faces of all who enter his holy mountain, the kingdom of heaven. And he will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. Isaiah writes, we trusted in him, and he saved us. Get ready to rejoice. In fact, rejoice right now, because the work has been done on the most brutal tool of death ever devised by man. The work has been done on the cross. The work has been done by that baby in Bethlehem, that boy from Nazareth, that Savior from the kingdom of heaven, Jesus Christ. And here's the kicker. He did it all for you. Are you not feeling the love today? Well, he did it for you. He did it for you, he did it for you, and you. Your shepherd, Jesus Christ, is, is all you need. You can rest in his presence. You can drink clean water without fear. He restores your soul, David writes in Psalm 23. He guides you in righteous paths and will walk with you as you journey through the valley that seems deadly. You don't need to fear evil. His rod and his staff, they're not there to punish you. 
He uses them to guide you and to comfort you so you are aware of his presence. And there's a party waiting for you, being catered like never before. And there's a table set for you where you will dine with those you thought were your enemies. And how surprised you will be to see that they made it to heaven. And by the way, how surprised they will be to see that you made it to heaven. He will anoint you with his love and it will never run out. Goodness, grace, love, and mercy will tide you over while you are here and you will eventually dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Praise God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's go to our Lord now in the prayers of the church. Let's pray. Lord, you, you are our shepherd. You provide everything we need. We thank you, Father, for life and liberty. You have placed us in this place at this time to experience family, friends, work, and worship. We owe all we are, all we have, to you. Thank you for the freedom we have here in this country to congregate together safely, to praise you and build each other up in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, you have created this Sabbath day for our benefit, and you command us to take advantage of this Sunday, the day your son was raised from the dead, to rest, experience peace, and to have our strength renewed. When we stray from your original intent, guide us in your right path so we can bring honor to your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of eternal life, you call us to live in freedom, not fear. Bring your peace into our lives when we feel lost, sad, and insignificant. When we walk through those dark valleys, give us your power to climb back into a life of promise, encouragement, and purpose. We need not be afraid because you watch over us, you guide us, you protect us, and you comfort us. Good and gracious God, we ask that your righteousness reign in our nation and all nations that long for lives of peace and freedom for humanity. We pray for the United States and all those who have been called, elected, and appointed to serve her citizens. As the never-ending election cycle generates speed once again, we ask you to infuse a sense of civility, fairness, and integrity in the proceedings. Call our judges to be unbiased. Call our representatives in city, state, and federal offices to service, not selfishness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we pray for victory and stability for the nation of Israel. Give strength to your people. Remind them that you are the God that made the Hebrew people your own. Defend them and drive their violent enemies back and beyond the borders they crossed. Comfort those who have suffered injury and loss of life. And Lord, soften the hearts of their enemies. Bring to these hateful and harmful souls an awareness of their atrocities. Freeze their thoughts and actions and let them see your power and your promise. Lord of peace, we pray for fighting to cease in Ukraine. We pray for full retreat of the Russians and an end to this 18-month-old war that has killed thousands and has tapped resources that could be used to build people up instead of making more weapons for war. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of our Savior, we pray for your church. Where people gather today, may they hear the truth of your word, not the lies devised by a watered-down grace making room for sin in our lives. For those who resist or refuse you, rob them of sleep. 
make them uneasy, and place one of us in their path to share the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ. Build up this congregation called Zion Lutheran. Arm us and strengthen us to be a light in this community and a place of learning, fellowship, and edification. Let the parents and the young people of this surrounding area be filled with an unquenchable curiosity to know more about you, your Son, and your Holy Spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of comfort and healing, there is at times a pall of sadness that invades our hearts and our minds, where there is mourning over love we have lost. Bring peace, acceptance, trust, and joy. Where there is pain, limited movement, weakness, and disease, bring healing. Where there is darkness of mind and coldness of heart, bring your light and your spiritual fire to warm us and to be certain of your presence in our lives. Father, today we present to you the names of family and friends of this congregation that are in need of your power and your presence in their lives. We pray for the future pastor of Zion Lutheran. We pray for the call committee you have charged to locate and call this man or this woman. We pray for the physical and emotional needs of Bonnie Bieber, Mary Jo Gimbel, Mitzi Eberhard Ringard, Kayla Setsji, B. Shelsky, Nicholas Fisher, and Joe Keppen. I pray too, Father, for those suffering from my church family in Brandon, Dallas, Jane, Bernie, Karen, Roger, and there are so many others, Lord, that we don't know about, but you do. And Father, we pray silently right now for those who are on our hearts and minds and are in need of your intervention in their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of eternal life, we trust that when you raised your son, Jesus Christ, from the dead, those of us who believe in him will experience that same resurrection and ascension into heaven to be in your presence. When that time comes, Lord, let us transition peacefully and with the assurance of the faith we worship you with today. Lord God, hear us now as we pray those familiar words Jesus prayed with his disciples, our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And friends, receive this blessing and this benediction. This is from our reading today from Philippians 4. This is from the New Living Translation. Always, always be full of joy in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful, far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Jesus Christ. Amen.